I want to make it more natural, <laughs> more um, less confrontational, because it's not yet clear. Um, I run a financial research firm, and I like to go deep. But the interesting thing is always to share learnings in terms of experiences. So what I want to make today is, you know, dive you through experiences so that you learn it yourself without me having to teach you. But the thing is, uh, we'll do that interactively, and um, you can relax. Or you, you can actually take your, you know your phone out. All of you, it's allowed now. <laughs> and this is something else I cannot tell because of the session will actually be interactive. So you go to your web browser, you enter uh, slider.com, and then the code stern, which will allow us to, um, which allow me to ask questions, and you can answer without having to raise your hand. In this topic, this is always very embarrassing. A lot of people don't like to do it because they could say something wrong or people could laugh at them afterwards because it's really difficult to get things right. As a matter of fact, um, many things are not as clear cut as, as they think. So when I ask you questions, it's not about right or wrong. It's about what we think about something and learning <laughs> what other people think. When I talk about sustainability, when I got this topic from um, the Oikos conference, I immediately thought about two aspects of sustainability. One is, how sustainable is your investment? And then also a second topic, which is not really covered yet at the conference, how sustainable are these investments for your retirement? The other two things, we go first through the question of sustainability in investing, and then second, and most probably more important for you, sustain sustainability for you yourself. I would like to first ask you, if you have a low carbon footprint stock, let's assume we can measure that, and you have to make a prediction what kind of return you expect from that stock, I am asking you about an excess return. Excess means above market. It's an excess return. Do you think this is going to be a positive excess return because it's a carbon neutral or a low, has a low carbon footprint, do you think it is average or do you think that stock will have a below average return if it's carbon friendly, if it's climate friendly? At Obermott, we actually call them climate friendly stocks. We have a selection of stocks uh, that we picked where the carbon footprint is a lot lower irrespective of the industry which means you get the oil companies with lower carbon footprint than other oil companies as well. It's not just those companies that do not have a, a, a low carbon footprint. So if you have all answered, then let's go to the next question. Same uh, question, basically, for <laughs> a female-friendly stock. Actually, I, was, I, was, I, I discussed when we at Obermott, we selected... Um, uh, female-friendly stocks based on the women empowerment principles. I was told I should not call that female-friendly, I should call it family-friendly. So from now, now actually those stocks on our website are called family-friendly. Again, the same question. Do you think this is going to be above or below average or average if you invest there? Then I go a little bit faster. The next question about high governance, I see you're already answering. And now come the interesting question. Um, I'll call it beverage. Do you think it's above average or below average? And then finally, um, weapons and defense companies. And I can already tell it's interesting to see. So uh, this is the first time I'm using this. I can now show the results. Most of you people think you have average returns from a low carbon footprint. Actually, now turned to above average. <laughs> Stop <laughs> voting, because otherwise I have to change my story all the time. And it's not about you being right or wrong. It's really about learning what we think. Do we think that we have an above average return? Then the second question, does it show you the results? Yes, it does. Here, um, we have a very similar result, right? Here, it's above average. Here, it's average, we think. I stay with, actually, I can eat somewhere. Stop. Stop the polling, but I don't know. I can lock it, so voting locked. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the first I'm using this. Good governance, we think is above average. Then um, we go to the quest from, from uh, alcoholic beverage. We believe average, above average, and 
than military and uh, weapons. Here we think it's above average to return. So, let's assume we arrived. We have now identified, if I remember that correctly, a couple of industries where you expect an above average um, return. This is uh, weapons, basically. This is average. Then um, governance is above average. That's tight. Uh, and we have, um, again, above average with climate-friendly stocks. What do you think would a professional <laughs> investor do if we were right? If it's correct that we can expect an above average return from climate friendly stocks, what would the professional investor do? Yes. Invest in it. Exactly. Yeah. What would then happen? The price would go up. So, whenever there is information in the market where we know that there is an excess return, plus or minus, we also have to assume that the market is aware of that and adjusts for that. Which basically means, no matter what, even if it's weapons or alcoholic beverages, you cannot accept, expect an above average return. It's not possible. Because you actually contradict the market. And the good news is, you can also not expect the below average return. So next time you go out there and you take a stock that you really like, there is no reason to believe that this stock is going, is going to punish you for being nice. It's not an important insight. I think it is extremely important because it means you can actually pick stocks on the market and you will not have to worry about the returns in the future. And a lot of people think if they do something nice, if they buy an ESG fund, and actually we had a lot of you know, discussions here how they will have future out, out, outperformance returns in the future, and it was proven with many you know, research studies in the past, but as a matter of fact, as soon as we believe that there is an outperformance return, it's not going to happen anymore. The reason is, markets are prediction markets. You're not really trading stock, really. What you're trading, trading are expectations about the future. And because you actually put down your money, researchers know prediction markets where you have to make a bet are the best possible guess that a population can have about the future. It doesn't mean you can divert from the general opinion, but you have to know that this will be a contrarian position. It cannot be, it's not mass market. This, I think, for me, relieves me from a lot of stress when I invest. It means I don't have to be smarter than the market because the market is quite smart. I don't have to be one of those people who wants to outperform the market because what I'm getting from the market is good enough. And I'm not going to get punished for picking anything wrong. And that, it's really important uh, for the for, for uh, assessing basically ESG investments for yourself, that while you cannot really expect an above average return, you can also not expect a lower return. Let's go a little bit more into the details and ask ourselves what are criteria that we find important? Which one is more important? So I picked the first one and you can actually go through and I'll let you go through, through that one. Um, Let's go through the criteria. Which criteria is more important for you when it comes to the first couple of criteria are social, then uh, climate, then we come to social, and then we come to governance criteria. I have, you know, eight to ten. So is being good at the protection of biodiversity more important than being good at hazardous waste management? Again, there is no right or wrong. It's really your opinion, what you believe is the more important factor. And you can actually go down, because I, I'm not going to read them all aloud. Just go down, make up your mind. I'm going to lock the poll afterwards <laughs> when you're finished. And then we can look through what you thought. These are the environmental criteria that have been researched by... Um, who did that? Uh, I was not MIT in the next study. I think they got 641 criteria. And you can tell, you know, climate change is one of the criteria, um, energy consumptions, for instance, 
pollution management. And what is interesting here in that chart, it tells you how important that criteria is, actually, for the ESG rating companies. And I've picked now criteria from here, where I picked one, protection of biodiversity, which is really highly rated, and then I picked one that was not so highly rated by the ESG agencies. And now we can go back and we can look. Always the first one is the one that is highly rated by the ESG um, rating agency. And now let's see how, how much we agree with that. We don't agree, yeah? I have to lock it again. We don't agree, yeah? Already. Let's look at the next one. Reduction of emissions. I have to see, let's say, can I go back to not, not showing the result? Not showing? We do agree. Huh? We do agree. On we, we do agree, huh? Just want to make sure I'm... It flipped it around, you know, this is the problem. Do you still have it in front of you? Yeah. Why don't you look if it's the upper one or the lower one? Because here it actually displays automatically the one... Yeah, oh. right. Here, on, on my, I, I can actually, I also have it. Okay. So we here don't agree. It switched it around. Huh? On the next one, here we agree. Human rights are more important than uh, rights of indigenous people. We don't agree on uh, community relations worth of promotion of inequality. Uh, next one. We don't agree. Privacy and data security. We agree on transparency versus executive compensation, which actually is an interesting uh, topic. Now, the, the point that I want to make here is, on the majority of cases, if I count it correctly, we do not, would not do the same weighting of criteria that official ESG rating agencies do. So how much can we trust them? You know, buying ESG fund, it turns out, they weight things 180 percent, you know, differently than we would do. It's just, you know, put on the head, and that's a big problem. So. You would, your chart would look different. You would probably be you know, out here and back in here, you know? And you cannot actually use these consolidated ESG ratings. What is also interesting is something else that you see on this chart. I use this chart to show you the complexity of ESG rating, and this is just uh, the ecology inside. It also tells you the difference from 10 years ago and today. So today, you can already tell the ecological aspects are a lot more important than they were, uh, I don't know when year it was exactly, uh, 8 versus 18. So 18 is now, this is the solid line, it's research from this year, and the dotted line was uh, 10 years ago. And the interesting thing is, um, in 2008 it was mainly in environmental policies, while nowadays it's climate change, it's reduced emissions, it's reduced consumption, so it changes. Really interesting. I mean, we, we have 10 years only and a complete new set of weighting of those criteria, which I think is a huge problem when you invest in an ESG fund. So let's go to the next criteria. These are the social criteria. And uh, you have the same picture. I think also in social criteria, you could tell sometimes it's a little bit more than it used to be, but actually it's more probably just a change in, in priorities in the, on the social side. It was more human capital development. I think that was on the right side. When I, yeah. Development training it was more important in 2008 than after the credit crisis. You know, things like labor management, quality working condition, health and safety, uh, and supply chain management, probably because of the child labor issues and stuff become more important. So um, we have a huge change again also in this, this area, but it's not an improvement of importance. It's more a shift, I guess, from the... Uh, importance of individual ESG ratings. And finally, governance. That to me looked a little bit more like it used to look. It seems to be pretty similar. I mean, we have some extreme cases which are different, but um, by far and large, it's the attention moved from pay to more, you know, pay was a big concern in 2008, you know, executive pay was a big concern. Now, the big concern is actually corruption and transparency. So, um, this is a problem, you know, basically. We have a different weighting. What should we do? It actually gets worse. It actually gets worse. The ESG ratings who assess this, and that's, you know, the ESG rate, you know, rating agents that assess this, 
cannot agree. MIT did a study, and you, would, you see the result here. So it's you know, a lot of stuff. What is important is here you have a company, L'Oreal, and you have four different of the leading uh, ESG rating agencies, and they have all really different ratings for the same company. It's really bad. The correlation is 0 0.61, right? For credit ratings, it's 0 0.99. And you would assume, you know, these agencies agree, but they actually not agree. That means management has no idea what they should do. There's a rater effect, which means it's a halo, of, sort of a halo effect. If a rater sees something that's really good, it's going to rate other things of the same company higher. They found that as well. They cannot even agree, the rating agencies, on hard facts. If they're a member of the UN Global Compact um, thing, is something that the rating agencies only agree to 86%. They cannot even agree if it's the CEO and the chair separated. Rating agencies have a correlation of 0 0.56. It's really shocking. And when you look at the best companies, they rated, they looked at 839 companies, and only 26 were in the top 20%. It should be 168 companies. So you could imagine, I mean, this ESG rating is actually something quite confusing. It, it, it looks even worse when you go closer. It's, it's really all over the place. It really is. On top of that, <laughs> the really high-rated agencies are Kingfisher, alcoholic beverages, and... Tobacco, tobacco, imperial tobacco. It's a really high rated, you know, by ESG factor. Why is that? I'm going to cover that, that soon as well. Um, it's for them a lot more important as a marketing tool to have a high rating so they comply with as much as possible. So finally, I was actually here already yesterday and I you know, took a picture of something really interesting from a speaker in front of me, from, maybe someone, someone was here yesterday, maybe you remember. There are things that it's really difficult to agree, um, uh, agree on. You know, coal, we all agree, coal is bad. You know, for the time being, we all agree. But I don't think it, you know, is that really bad? You know, I mean, some people think it is bad, you know, if you're very religious. But then there are religions where, you know, this topic is a lot less important. And I know there is also a generation, generation change. You know, while my generation was still a little bit conservative, the generation today is a lot more tolerant. You know, think of gay marriage and stuff like that. So they will probably not worry if a lot of the entertainment companies in that portfolio. If you go, what was that? Nuclear Energy. I just watched a, a movie on Netflix from Bill Gates. Has anybody seen that? These three movies from Bill Gates on Netflix. Absolutely fascinating. Can, I can highly recommend it. One movie was only about how he reinvents nuclear energy. Um, he created a reactor, probably spent a couple of billions on that, that cannot explode. It's, 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 um, the, can, the, the reactors we have today have to be cooled so that they don't explode, so you cool them. And then in Koshima, they had the electric generators to generate the energy to cool the nuclear power plant in the basement where the water flew in. So I mean, of course, you know, the generators could not work anymore, there was no cooling, and Fukushima exploded. Bill Gates, somehow, because the technology by, by now is about 30 or 40 years old, there was no development since the 80s, probably since that Long Island, I don't know, what was it called, in, in the States, uh, catastrophe. There's no development in nuclear energy anymore. And he actually developed with scientists uh, a nuclear reactor that when you turn it off, basically when you don't attend to it, it just, it just keeps on generating heat. But it doesn't explode. It's, just, it's like a candle. It just burns down, basically. So it's a lot, lot safer. It's also, it also uses fuel uh, that is discarded from today's nuclear reactors. So you can actually reuse the fuel of today's electric generators and and uh, and use it to power that new type of generator. I don't know what that new type is going to turn out, but it's actually a lot cleaner than you would think. And it certainly is better than climate change, you know, if you ask me. My mother was one of those atomic, uh, uh, Atomkraft Nein Danke Gegner in, um, in Switzerland. And I agree with her. I think, she's, I think she had the sticker on her BMW. <laughs> it's a joke to the whole family. But, you know, I really admire her for being so proactive. 
And I was, uh, uh, I was really, until I watched that movie, I was against nuclear energy, but nowadays you could debate it. You know, is that really a company you want to exclude? I bought, um, I bought the stock um, <coughs> RWE, RWE, it's a German um, energy company. And later I found out that they do still have a lot of, you know, atom, you know nuclear energy plants, but they also have a lot of plants for, plans for renewable energy. So it's not really a good reason to exclude that. So the bottom line is really hard to get to get criteria, and um, I'd like to actually do the second poll now. Uh, and how do we have that? The next one is let's make an ESG fund together. So you cannot only we don't only have to agree on. Um, so here we don't have to we don't only have to agree on what. ESG criteria we would like to use. You also have to agree on what industries you would like to invest. So pick the industries that you would that you would invest. You know, oh, it's really interesting. Yeah, okay, now it changes. Just pick the industries where you think, like you know, this should be you, you want to be invested, and you know the industries where you don't want to be invested, you 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 don't pick. And then we basically get we basically get a picture. Yes, are you finished? Let's lock it and let's show the results. Oh no. No, this is the wrong one. Here. Okay, let's um, no. Do we see the results? Yeah, you see it, okay. So we would we would make a fund together, our own ESG fund here in this room, that would focus on technology and energy, has a little bit of industrial health care, has very little retail, has about, you know, still a little bit of financial services. Now, the, the next question is, you know, try to picture that. This is our fund. We execute this. We, we use this as a weight in for the industries on top of the ESG factors. Let's go to the next questions. Assuming you could invest in this fund, would you invest in this fund? Who would have invested in that fund that we just agreed on? Our criteria, our selection of industries. So someone would not invest. <coughs> Most of you would invest. It's probably one learning here is already if you do something yourself, you're much more likely to invest. It's actually my point that I want to make for today. Um, now, the next question is, those that say maybe, you know, think about the reasons why you would not invest. And let's try if that would work. Now you can actually enter... You can actually enter words, and um, I'm just interested to see what are sort of what are the arguments that would speak against investing in that fund. Is there anything that comes up to your mind? You don't have to answer. We can also just skip it. I was just wondering if there if there are things that come to your mind why you would not invest in this fund. That's that's a good one. Not enough information. I should actually stop here because that's the point I want to make on the next. <laughs> little focus on financial services. That's a very interesting one. Can you also upvote the other questions? I think you can. I don't know if it works. Maybe not. Energy market is not spayful, not specific enough. Field that I want to exclude. Negative screening. You would like to add that. Sectors don't say that much. There are several companies. For me, real estate is uh, more important, not clear, if really sustainable. <laughs> it does not only depend on the industry, but also on other factors. To a little focus on financial services, not enough information. Technology is a very broad term. We keep it, I keep it actually, I keep it um, uh, broad uh, because then it's a lot easier to answer it in a session like that. Uh, let's go out there into the market and where is our uh, here is, um, and look at real examples. I went to BlackRock, which is the largest um, ETF provider of uh, ESG funds. I searched for equity, you know, if I can invest in equity, sustainable, you know, funds basically for you. This is what I selected, and to my big surprise, there are only five funds. Maybe I did something wrong. Could be. But, you know, I tried it again, I deleted everything, and I selected again, and, you know, the biggest provider just has five different funds, and 
when I wanted to know, you know, fact sheet, when it download the fact sheet, I only got a fact sheet for three files of the five. <laughs> So it's really, it's, it seems to be nascent, uh, to, to, to say the least. I mean, there was just very, very little information there. I, I downloaded the fact sheet. Turned out that, you know, they are a little bit different, but the fact sheets are all the same. Um, I, I'm going to show you what kind of information you get when you invest in an ESG fund. And for those that, for that person that said not enough information, would like, uh, dig, uh, like to dig deeper, this is really all you get. A diversified exposure to large and mid-cap companies in the European Monetary Union while screening out companies involved in controversial business areas. <laughs> so the good thing is you have now experienced <laughs> what it means to select criteria for screening, and you have also experienced what it means when you exclude certain sectors. For many people, this is just not necessary. In addition, you have you know, a greater rating on companies you know, with high ESG scores. So this is one information you got, and I was desperately looking for more information. And it turns out I found this. 18% of that fund in Europe is in invested in financial services. And if you remember, if you remember that our waiting for financial services was, was lower. There was a couple of people that didn't even want to have financial services in their fund. So when you buy this fund, you're making a, de a decision, a sector decision, that may not be your decision at all. Has anybody an idea why financials are there on top? Just out of your stomach, you know? There, what, what could be reasons? They don't pollute much. They don't? Much. Yes, they don't pollute anything. They, for them, it's very easy to promote uh, social issues because they have all rich employees, so they can promote women a lot better than others, you know, of course. Uh, for that reason, financials have also reputational issues, so they all want to be the good guys in the ESG arena. So you get a lot of uh, a lot of companies there, a lot of companies uh, in the financial sector. And if you go to the technology, you know, which for us was dominant, and energy, it's only five percent in energy. So you're getting something completely different than what you think you got yourself into, and this is a big problem. As a matter of fact, you know, at this point, uh, when I drafted this uh, presentation, I, I, uh, I thought, you know, by now it should really be clear you have to pick the stocks yourself. Because, you know, you cannot rely on ESG scores and you cannot rely on funds that have been created based on those ESG scores because they are um, decisions about industries and regions and companies that may not be the same as yours. And then I anticipated then that somebody would say, buy an index fund. And uh, that, you know, uh, that reminded me of my very early days when I had to defend my approach of self-investing, self-picking of stocks. I looked at those e index funds, uh, typically ETFs, you know, it's a more popular uh, term. And I tried to find out how well do those industry, those index funds, represent a country. So how well does the Swiss market index, the SMI, represent, <laughs> you already know the answer, the Swiss market. And what you see here is, this is the Swiss market index, blue in its rating, and red is the gross product, the gross national product, domestic product of Switzerland. It basically means uh, when you invest in the Swiss market index, you have more financials, you can actually not see that, more financials than you think, you have a lot more healthcare. <laughs> so it should actually be not called the Swiss market index, it should be called the Swiss healthcare index, plus a little bit of industrials and banks. You know, this is really what it should say. And you also, that's, that's a, chronic, a chronic problem of any index fund that you can buy out in the market. There's a lot less services than there actually are in a country. Any idea why there are less services on the public market than typically in a country? I have an explanation, but it's really just mine. It's not research or anything. I think service companies have it a lot easier to raise capital. They don't have to go to the public markets. It's typically enough you can actually work with your own capital because you don't have, it's not very capital intensive. While banks need a lot of capital to grow, and healthcare needs a tremendous amount of capital. So that's why these companies go public. In other words, the companies that are public on the markets are not the ones you would choose. They are the ones that need the public money. 
So the index fund is really actually a reflection of something completely arbitrary. And you think that happens just in Switzerland. Let's go to the Standard Poor's 500 index, and it just looks very, very similar. Also here we have an overweighting of financials, we have an overweighting of healthcare, industrial, I left away other sectors. Right now they have a, this is also about three or four years old when I did this, right now they have a heavy overweight of technology stocks in the Standard Poor's 500. This now is the biggest index, the biggest market worldwide. But when you buy this market, it should not be called the Standard Poor's 500. It should be called the Standard Poor's High Tech Index because they're so much dominated. You know, in the last 10 years, only five companies that hold funds, you know, for Facebook, Apple, etc., um, uh, they have generated so much return that without those five companies, this, this, the index would have actually depreciated in value. So you're getting something completely different. You're not getting really what you want to get. And to come back to Switzerland, how it looks today, uh, when you buy the Swiss market index, uh, it's, it's mainly dominated by these, uh, these three companies. So it's not at all a diversified you know, portfolio. If you go to your bank and you buy this as your portfolio, they will probably give you a call and say, you are too heavily exposed by the index fund. <laughs> You know, they would probably say you should not just focus on three stocks. You should have more of an equal weight approach to investing. And this is actually something you cannot do with indices. Because indices are always weighted by market capital. So we, you will always get the stocks that have a heavy market capital in an overweight. That you would never do. If I ask you now, how would you weigh your portfolio? You know, something I've thought about, how would I weigh my portfolio? And you probably haven't, so I think you might answer. I would probably weigh it by the profit they make, for instance. You know, I mean, companies that make more profit at a higher way, or I would weigh it by the sales they make, or by the number of employees or the number of invested capital. I would never come to the idea to weigh the portfolio by the price of the stock. It's just something totally unnatural. And why do you think that happens so much uh, uh, with funds? It's also an easy answer. It's a lot easier to make a financial product if you weight the stocks by market cap. Does that have anything to do with you? You're getting closer and closer to your personal sustainability? I don't think so. Uh, let's go back to the ESG fund by uh, BlackRock. Um, that's something really funny there. Uh, it also has a performance chart. Basically tells you when you start in February 11, and you end up in February 20, you know, this is really the, the fund's performance. Uh, depending on the history, it looks different. So if there were a crash somewhere, you probably start after the crash. We had the crash here in 2010, 9, 8. So they start after that crash. Then it looks really good. And what was really interesting here to see is that they, they, they put something uh, which is called uh, benchmark uh, to compare to. So, and implying here, basically, this is almost like the benchmark. It turns out, what is the difference between the benchmark and your, and, and your fund is called the tracking error. You've heard that word if you've been here yesterday already. The tracking error is, you know, how much la do I lag behind my benchmark? Sometimes, actually, I'm in front of the benchmark. Sometimes I'm behind. More often, you're behind because you're not fast enough to buy the stocks or you want to buy them first for another client who knows that. You don't know. We cannot get that information. It's impossible. Um, it turns out we lose 1% over the 10 years, which is another 0.1% every year. Yeah, it's a cost that you are not, you know, you, you look at the cheap index fund, the SMA you can buy for maybe 20 basis points of 0.2%, but you have to add 0.1% because they just don't pick the stocks the right way. I don't know where that money uh, gets lost. But the worst thing is actually this type of chart. And I'll show you at an example. I have a good friend who went into uh, wealth management and um, he has his own company. He's very successful. And um, he came to me a couple of years ago. It's 2016. And he showed me, you know, let's call him Andreas, how well he performed over time. And if we compare that to a really prestigious fund like Big Day or LGT, you know, you know, they were a lot worse, you know. And uh, I looked at the chart, and I was like, yeah, it's really good. You know, since 2004, we're now in 2016. That's more than 12 years, really a long period. And it's completely outperforming. 
Does anybody see something suspicious on that chart? It's really hard to see. It's really hard to see. Yeah, Valentin? It actually follows the same path. Yeah, that's what I, that's what actually got me working. <laughs> like, you know, it's actually quite similar if you take out, you know, <coughs> here, from here, it looks actually quite similar. And what I did is, he, he used that charge to convince me, or tried to convince me he performs better than the index. And what I did is, I wanted to look in what year did he actually perform better. So instead of using that chart, I plotted down all these points. I had to do that from hand, because of course it doesn't give you the data. And it turns out, that's how it looks if you look at annual change in the portfolio. And you can already tell now that, you know, here in 2005, I think, you know, Pictet performed. In 2009, Pictet outperformed. In 11 as well. In 13, they were the same. In 14, they outperformed. 15, they outperformed. And 17, they outperformed as well. It turns out in 8 versus 6 cases, Pictet outperformed Andre <laughs> in that year. And suddenly, it looks very different. He basically only made money once here in the credit crisis. If I want to invest in Andre, I should only do that if I expect another credit crisis. Because he may actually do better again because he's quite smart. He makes a lot of money with that work. If I look at the most, more recent time frame, if I start in 2010, not much later, I think they actually perform better overall. Now you think this is constructed. This is just, you know, Andre, um, my friend uh, Andreas uh, was also at the high scale. <laughs> So you would think like, yeah, oh, this is just a high scaler, and of course he, he, he kind of, <laughs> he cheats his way around. But you know what? Um, there are others too. Yesterday, the exact same chart was pre presented by a professor from Lugano. I don't want to blame him. It's done over and over again, and I want to take a picture today as well from the Credit Suisse uh, presentation, the yeah, UBS presentation. If you look at that performance, you come to the conclusion, you know, Switzerland does really well, but if you, if you just pick another, if you just start here, for instance, you know, compared to Europe, then Europe would be up here. Europe would completely outperform Switzerland. And it's something you cannot see. You, you know, you could probably interpret this one correctly, you know. But then, you know, just a little bit later, um, we get the exact same chart. You don't see it here, but basically, it was another metric, outperforming for a while here, and from here on, just going in parallel. That's another fact. They dropped more, the one that the line that we liked better than the line we didn't like so much. They didn't drop as much. Maybe because they can't drop as much. And my conclusion is really don't ever trust this type of graphs. <coughs> it's, it's, it's done by everybody, and what is completely forgotten is not that they are misleading. I mean, you could use the graph that I drafted, and of course. The problem is the time frames we're looking at here are way too short. Every statistician that you tell you, 2004 to 2019 doesn't mean anything. If, if an economist does an analysis, it has to be 30 or 50 years. And nobody's around to prove for that long. It's just, it's just, it's just a, a matter of fact. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean people are not outperforming. I believe LGT and uh, UBS and uh, Safa Sarasi do a very good job in active management, but they cannot prove it with numbers. This is the, the big difference. I think active management makes a lot of sense, but do not try to prove it with numbers. It's always misleading. Be honest about what you do, you know. That's why I say, I do it this and this way. And if that worked over the past 10 years, it doesn't even matter, because we also know things go in cycles. We forget that. We tend to forget that, that, you know, investing is a little bit like life, you know. If you have a certain style of investing, it performs very well. And then there's a time when it doesn't perform well, like the last 10 years. Dividends have really performed very well. Value investing has performed bad. High-tech investing has performed really very well. And when you... When you base your investment decisions on past performance, it means you buy here and you buy, you sell here. You buy here and you sell here. Because you always buy, buy the stock or the fund with the best performance then it's, when it's peaking 
and you're selling when it's actually at the low point. I have this uh, insight from uh, a company called in, uh, Research Affiliates, who's trying to do another way of weighting of the indices <laughs> they perform. And the CEO there said, don't buy our phones. They're totally overvalued. You know, Research Affiliates is here, and the CEO gets getting really nervous that, you know, because of his investment funds all performed so well, they are now really expensive, and if people now move in, they're all going to be disappointed. And he was honest enough to say that. In addition, um, that performance is such a bad metric, um, there is also there was also a there is also a risk metric that is lo uh, used a lot, which is deviation from the mean, from the market mean, uh, the, the beta was discussed today. I think it was discussed yesterday as well. And if we assume now that um, this is a market index, uh, let's let's do it a little bit differently. Uh, if we assume this is a market index and this market index today is dominated by tech and oil companies, you know. Let's say, let's take oil companies. How would an oil company probably perform because it's dominant in the market? It would probably be similar to here. You know, somebody in the future will realize that oil doesn't have a big future. I don't know about the future, but maybe it could be that these oil companies don't have a good future underperforming the index, you know? And if you then compare, if you then measure the beta that you look today, um, then this beta would be quite low because it still would move with the market because it's a large stock. If you take a wind company, wind energy for instance, you know, it doesn't have anything to do, even if it does like this, it's going to have a very bad beta. It's going to have a lot of deviation from the index. So when you look at this, it has nice words, you know, Markowitz was the big, the big term yesterday, the, uh, what's it called, uh, risk adjusted return, you know. Risk-adjusted return gives you a good risk-adjusted return for the oil company and a bad risk-adjusted return for the wind energy company just because wind energy is not yet dominant. So the second most important figure um, is again something that is really dangerous to rely on. And then finally, the case that is, is made very often, I jump now a little bit, I have this down, is how much you actually pay. Um, I did this chart... Uh, <laughs> I have to tell the story afterwards. What you have here is when you save 10,000 every year for 30 years, something you should do. I didn't do it, I have to save a lot more now. Um, so you take the cheapest fund worldwide, Standard Poor's 500 has 0.17%. There's now discussion, there's zero costs actually for a Vanguard fund, but things like the SMI are a lot more expensive often. Um, Euro stocks more expensive. When it comes to emerging markets, 0.67 is not uncommon. We don't even have included the tracking error and other costs that they can, the funds can actually charge directly without showing it in the total expense ratio to the fund money, in, for instance, trading fees. Or you go to a financial advisor, you know, you basically lose, after 30 years, you lose at least a, a mini, <laughs> or whatever that is, you got to punto probably. I made the case for, Credit Suisse is not one of the sponsors, right? I made the case for, <laughs> The case of Credit Suisse, where I'm being charged for the Dritte uh, Säule product. You know, the third pillar in Switzerland is a popular saving product for everybody in Switzerland. And they're charging between 1 and 2%. And I made the case that if you calculate for 30 years and you pay in, at the end of the day, you've lost a Tesla. It's about 120,000 francs. And for me, I, there's even a blog, you know, Tesla, Hermes Stern, and you know, Credit Suisse, you'll find. And for me, it was just amazing how much money you actually leave on the table for something that is so difficult to measure. You know, the performance is so difficult to measure. Not saying professional investors do a bad job. I'm convinced they do a good job. But we cannot measure it. And it certainly is dubious after, you know, for ESG funds when we see how difficult it is to actually even assess the criteria for such an ESG fund. And now we are actually coming to uh, something else. Uh, you've seen now it's probably worth investing. And my big question now is, um, would you? <laughs> this, is, this is the next, the next topic. Um, a lot of people would not invest. Uh, and I'd like to try again why you would not invest yourself. What is it that you know, keeps you? You can also just you know, use a word. 
Why would you not now, after seeing that how much it costs, how difficult it is to assess performance, and how difficult it is to set the right criteria, uh, why would you not um, invest yourself uh, and pick the stocks yourself? And now we are really by the question of sustainability for you. There are reasons, because very few people actually manage their own money. Too much work, fear of losing my whole investment. I think we could already stop here. <laughs> no understanding of the market. Overwhelming. Uh, sorry, I have to show it to you, of course. Fear, yes. So let's start first with the question. So it's really a lot of work, I would say. It's very complicated, so it's, it's, it's know-how, it's loss, the topic of loss, topic of know-how, and the topic of work. And I would like to actually focus on that now, which means we can probably stop this again. Let's stop it. Um, let's make an exercise on loss aversion. I have this from Credit Suisse, by the way. I like Credit Suisse a lot now. My son just got a job there. So that's changed everything. <laughs> um, starting his apprenticeship this summer. And it's really exciting what Credit Suisse does for young people. Um, they made an exercise with me. Let's assume we bet. We make a bet. We bet with a coin. I have a coin here. And so it's a 50% chance to win or lose. If you win, you get 10 francs from me. If you lose, you pay me 3 francs. Be honest now, I'm not going to single you out. Who would do that bet with me right now? No, no, okay, no, actually, okay, you can actually put it down. So, 10% would not do it, 89 would do it. Should I lock it? Yes. Let's go to the next question. Six francs. You have to pay me six francs, and I'll pay you 10 francs. Okay. Now, you do it for real. You have to raise your hand if you don't want to bet. It's 10 against 9. Who would do the bet with me? I pay 10. If you lose, you pay me 9 francs. Who does not want to participate? After I pay someone, it does. Nobody, I cannot pick you. If somebody, if somebody had would have, would have done the bet? Who would have done it? Okay, well, I'll pay you. Is that okay? <laughs> so, who wants to throw the dice at a coin? Which one do you want to take? Head or? Head. Head, okay. What is it? <laughs> I won't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to pay. Okay. Um, the expectancy value of that bet, how much was it? The expectancy value was 50 cents. You would have gotten my 10 francs. 50 cents because you can lose with a 50%, you can lose 4 and francs. With a 50%, you can win 5 francs. The thing is, and we have already seen it here, losing hurts a lot. You know? And, you know, this is really brave of you. To you're probably very rational here, and so like, you know, this just doesn't make sense, you know. But most of us are really emotional. And this is one of the biggest reasons, the most important reason, why you should give the money to someone else. Because most people behave wrong when it comes to uh, investing. If you have to decide, do you like this market or this, you know, economy better than this one, most will actually say, I like this one a lot better. But the opportunity lies here. You see? When it's down, you know, when actually the markets are bad, then you have opportunity. And one of the biggest costs in self-investing is actually that you exit here and you buy here. And the question now is, how can you avoid that, avoid that fear of losing money? The fact is, you do lose, you do lose money. 
I've worked with that problem now for a while and I found a couple of interesting insights that help you control your emotions better. The first is, there was from a friend that also started high school that went to Bank Wegerin, which unfortunately does not exist anymore. But he showed me that the Great Depression actually created wealth. And he showed that by a picture which, which is now part of my advertising material. So if you've invested in 1929 a certain amount, and you look at what the index actually did, you know, the index actually you know, dropped a lot you know, to maybe 30% or 20% of its value in, 2000, in 1933, then we covered a little bit, down, all the way down to 1954. The normal reading of that chart is, this was really bad. If I had invested my money here in 1929, I would have to wait until 1954 until I had my money back. But this friend from Wegelin told me this is the wrong picture because you get dividends every year. You have to assume that you reinvest those dividends. And when you reinvest those dividends, you're actually up here. There's something that you completely forget that low market prices, a crashing market creates buying opportunities. So you have to find a way of not looking, of not worrying about this, of not doing here the wrong thing, just to stay invested, take the dividends, reinvest them, you get more money, and if we hypothetically assume that there would have been no crash, that we would have a straight line, the index would have not lost any money up till 1954, we would have less money. It's amazing. I mean, this, it's an amazing, that, that you, when you start to realize that the crash is good for you, that at the end of a certain period, you'll have more money than without the crash it becomes less threatening. As a matter of fact, I've done an exercise then on Excel. If we have a straight line over some time, you know, you get this return. Uh, no, straight line, you get this return, again, the same picture, but if it's volatile, you get a much higher return. Because every time here, you buy more shares than you would not buy here when it's expensive. And then you look at this picture, you think, like, maybe volatility isn't that bad. It's actually a good thing. There was this other case where, you know, another friend of mine worked for Pricewaterhouse and, you know, they had, for some reason, they had a very special uh, pension fund. Normally, pension fund is, has an insurance component, so you're pretty safe with the money in the pension fund is what you get out. But Pricewaterhouse negotiated a deal with the pension authorities and the tax authorities that they could have a fund that just goes up and down, whatever. And then my friend had this situation um, that his partner, one of the partners, had to exit in 2009. So at the, at the, really at the very bottom of the market. And he told me, it's really terrible. You know, we have this fund that is not just secure. It went up and down and up and down. And at the end, when he left for retirement, he was down. He lost so much money versus the year before. What he forgets is, what he completely forgets is this picture. He made a lot more money beforehand. So even if you lose at the end, you should not look at this. You should look at what you had made with a fund that is less volatile, but is a much lower return. And that, did you get that? Okay. And that forgot another picture. We are not saving today and never for the next 30 years. We're saving every year. And I made a very interesting calculation. What happens if you invested every year in the worst markets of the world? You know, maybe you're too young for, for the pigs countries. You know the pigs, the toy pigs? It's about 10 years ago and Portugal, Ireland, Greece and Spain had the big crisis. These were really bad markets. And what I did then is I looked, you know, how much uh, would I have made in those markets over the last 20 years if I invested the same amount every year? Were you safe? And it turns out, with the exception of Greece, you would have money. One, one extreme case is actually uh, in Italy, which is, right now when you go to a bank, they would not recommend Italian stocks because, you know, the index went from like 2000 all the way down to now about half in 2016. That was when I did the research. So they would say like, this is a really terrible market, don't go there, and all the political you know, issues. But when you actually invest it every year, you know, you profit from low, from low um, situations in the market. And it turns out that when, from the 100 you invest, it's, it's readjusted. So here it's one time 100, you know, and here it's two times. And you actually calculate how much you got out. So it's compared to 100% is what you put in, and what you actually see is your wealth. 
And even in Italy, you made about 22% return. And it was really the worst case. In Portugal, you made more return than in Switzerland. Because in Switzerland, the market never crashed. So if you invest every year, the picture becomes a lot less dangerous. It's something to remember. Um, and the case I want to make now, that investing is actually something you would enjoy a lot more than you think of. Right now you think it's terrible. We had, um, I wrote it down, we had objections against investing that were, um, there was knowledge, uh, loss aversion, or lo fear of loss, something I you know, spoke about now, what it means. And? Work. Work, too much work, right, exactly. Yes, so what I've done is, I said, I still like you know, to know what I have. I like it because, very simple, I like to pick the chocolate that is in my box. When I did, you know, that was an advertising for my, for my idea of self-investing. Uh, a young student from Dartmouth, actually, who, who spent time at our place, told me, you know, this Forrest Gump movie, there's this scene, you know, life, is, life was like a box full of chocolates, you never know what's in it. I like to know, I like actually to know what's in it. And one of my cases is, if you pick the stocks yourself, you know what's in it. And in order to do that, I had to solve these problems, these problems of too much work, of loss aversion, and of um, work, right? No, work, information, and loss. Okay. The loss aversion, I'd like to cover that because that was the topic we had until now, can only be done by not looking at your portfolio. This is the only way. And today, I will never look at my portfolio. Because there's a 50% chance that the stock will have lost in a day. It's just statistics. There's only a 30% chance that your portfolio will have lost after a year. It's also statistics, but it's still 30%. So if you believe in what I've said now, and you're worried that you're going to feel bad about your losses, the only way, and that's actually in the New York Times, the only way is not look at it. There's no other tip I have, because loss is going to happen. And the other thing was, how do I make it less work? If, we, um, if I would like to ask you, what's the type of information you would need to have to make it less work? Um, what would you like to know from the stock? So if you invest in a stock, my question is, what is the information that you would like to have in order to make a decision? So you would like to know the channel development of the markets in order to buy or sell? Like the cost of the stock? Or what did you mean by cost? Past performance, analyst, out view, yeah? Kind of difficult. How do you select a stock? What do you need to know about it? I wanted to know the financial side of a stock. You know, is it more or less expensive? Is it safely financed? <coughs> How much did it grow? Which would allow me then to go to other aspects of the stock. Business model, expected value, expected performance. You have high demands, you know. I, you know, I cannot give you that because this is really the things we don't know. Sustainability you can measure, that's possible. What I wanted to know was, I wanted to know the financial side of a stock before I make my decision. And this is really my area of expertise. I look at a company like this. There's a balance sheet, it has assets, it has debt, equity and profits. They pay a dividends and they pay a market price. One information that is really important is, how high is that market price compared to the size of the company? And what I do is I relate the market price to the dividends, to the assets, to the equity, and to profits, four things, which I turned with an algorithm, algorithm to a value rating. And I'll explain it briefly. The value rating basically tells you that this stock is expensive or cheap right now. You have to pay attention because you have to actually afterwards pick your stock. 
The second thing I wanted to know is how much growth did that stock have in the past? You know, stock returns, sales growth, profit growth. This was an information I found interesting as well. But then I also wanted to know, does this company have a lot of debt? <laughs> because in 2001, I was invested with a lot of high-tech stocks. <coughs> at that time, I had my own high-tech startup, so it's not at all diversified, and decided I need to diversify. I cannot have only high-tech stocks and myself work in a high-tech company. So I picked a really safe stock in the energy sector with the name of Enron and made my experience that that is actually quite important. So I also have a safety rating. How much debt do this company actually have? And I would have seen that Enron had a really bad debt rating because they have a lot more debt than anybody else. I turned that into a ranking. So when you have something really complicated like the price-sales ratio, which for this, this by the way, the Novartis about three years ago or five years ago was 11.2. You know, I turned this number, which doesn't tell me anything, into a ranking for zero from zero from one to 100. 100 means really cheap, and 5 means actually quite expensive. You know, it's quite a bad price to sales ratio. I did that for all the metrics that I discussed. And the result is, the result is um, um, uh, a rating for value, growth, and safety. And what I would like you to do now is to pick a stock and make a decision, and afterwards explain in, in the audience why you made that decision. It's either a buy decision, it's a sell decision, or it's a hold decision. Hold means you don't know anything about that. But, you know, I, I prepared a couple of stocks. Here's really what we have to do. We, we pick a stock from the list. Um, you can search for it on Obermott to find more financial information, but you can also go to the website and find information about the stock, and that only give you 10 minutes. And then you make up your mind if you like that stock or not and you make a buy, sell, or hold decision, and then you can promote your idea in class if you'd like. And the list of stocks I have here, these are all stocks I picked because they have a good value rating, a good growth rating, a good safety rating, and then a good combined rating. This is basically tells you that this stock is not that bad. It goes more into details, but you know this is actually a stock that you should look at. And what I want you to do is, uh, and I opened the next, actually I opened the next poll um, so that not everybody takes the same one. You pick a stock and then you look into that um, in more detail. So please on your app pick the stock that you like and I, I'll show that so when something is picked you don't pick it anymore. Just pick another one. Yeah? Where, where do, you, do we see the, the stocks on your website? Uh, you you uh, Google the name of the stock plus Obermatt, Ober, okay. Obermatt, my, the name of the company, and we will find it as the first result. So Umicore, Movi is taken, Almstom is taken. Aviva is taken. Any other one that you'd like to pick? You can also do it together, you don't have to do it alone. Vestas, Mezzo, Cummins, still available. Also, Hino Motors, Total. You can also come up with a sell decision and you can explain why. Okay, Fujifilm has too many. Somebody needs to pick something else from Fujifilm. Umicore as well, too many. Pick something else so that you know we get we get the breath more. So if you have Fujifilm, try to take another one. Yeah, okay. So that looks better. Mezzo Fujifilm is covered by two, that's fine. Hino Motors and Total are not yet picked. We don't have to pick all of them. Should we start? Take ten minutes to look at the stock. Uh, either on Obermott with the ratings, but also on the website, and ideally use ESG information to make your decision as well. You know, see what they do, you know, how they promote their company, you know, and maybe an ESG-related story would help. Does anybody want to make a, a call for a stock they picked? Why you picked it? We like 
practice that? Who, no, what did I, you pick? I picked the uh, guests also talk because they make wind energy. <laughs> okay. And it said that the growth uh, is not expected to be very high, but I, I think it doesn't really matter. Okay, you like? So, so you make your first new gene lesson with your own set of criteria. <laughs> Who else would like to has a stock to share an idea? Would you like to share yours? Okay. I, I chose a movie on, uh, yeah, on, I looked uh, at the website, it says that they're growing and they are the leader in the industry, which is a uh, food packaging, and they were sustainable too, so that was interesting. And then I looked at the Stock exchange, the price of pollution, the price of the stock, and it was growing, so I think it can be good. Okay. Would you invest? Or I think so. Stock? Okay. Other opinions? Not a stock? Yes? Uh, I have a movie as well, but I would also invest because it seems like yeah, it's going to grow. Okay. Another stock? What did you pick? I did pick um, Fuji. Fuji? Okay. Especially because I already know the name. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, in the long term it looks like a growing market, but if I will only invest maybe for two years, I would sell at this point because it looks high. And expensive right now. Yeah, expensive. And also on Fobel Mart, it looks like the um, is it one? Umsatz sales, um, yeah. is, um, the sales are not that high anymore this year. Okay, they didn't have a lot of sales for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I chose Alstom, mm -hmm. and I think the the stock dropped years ago, so it's it's not that high at the moment, like the others, and it's a growth market, so I would buy it. What is it? Now. No, uh, what, what is the market for doing? Yeah, like trains, metros, all the e-buses, <laughs> and the new passenger systems. Okay. Yeah. What do you have? Um, Metro. Metso? Yes, and I would invest in it. Okay. Because it's a stable investment. Okay. And also a sustainable investment. What yeah. does Metso do? I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's it. Well, yeah, well, we can go. Now we can choose. Okay. Can you choose one? Uh, Unicorn. Unicorn? Yeah. I, I didn't know them before, but they're in kind of recycling, but in the battery area, and they just closed the contract for. Some years with um, with Samsung for okay. a long term contract, but the rating at Uber was for 2019 actually got quite worse in terms of security and I don't know the financing wasn't quite mm -hmm. secure. But I think the shares are at the moment quite cheap, so mm -hmm. maybe I would invest in. You would invest. Any other comments? Does anybody want to share something interesting with them? The reason why I did this is I made the experience that I created this stock algorithm because that's how I would invest. You know, I, I thought I don't want to give my money anymore someplace where I don't know where it will be. I was a little bit disappointed. I heard about for 15 years that I was an ETF investor. And I said, actually, I would like to know better what, what my assets really are. And for this to do, I created this algorithm to analyze the stocks and then to put that online. And I did that about five years ago and made a surprising um, discovery, which may happen to you too if you start your own company, that nobody cared about it. And uh, I was like, this is not possible. I've, I've run you know, ratings over 10,000 stocks. You know, this is really valuable. I really believe in it. And what should I do? And at that point, um, uh, Fortnite and Minecraft was just being popular, and my son at that time was about 10 years old, um, watched other people play these games, which was something for me completely new. You know, like, how can you watch someone else play? I just couldn't believe it, but he was so into it that he decided, I just now use my own system, and I buy my own stocks, and I put that online as a video. <laughs> um, and... Uh, at that point, I was really terrified because I now make a stock decision that will, that will certainly be a stock decision which is bad and I will look like a fool. Uh, I was really terrified. I started my first couple of picks and 
After two or three weeks, or five weeks, maybe it took two months or something, I suddenly, I suddenly realized it's more fun than I expected. And not the stock pickery, but I wanted you to have the experience that these stocks out there are actually quite interesting. You know, before we spend really little time right now, by helping you with the financial side of the stock, you feel a little bit more comfortable looking at those stocks because you already have a rating. And I'm only, not the only one. I mean, banks have really good ratings on stocks as well, and some of the banks are open about these ratings, and you can use them. And I realized uh, there are so many interesting stocks out there that I continue doing that. And in the meantime, I have 200 videos on how I picked stocks and about uh, 70 shares roughly that I bought. And of course, out of those 70 shares, I put actually my statement online so you can download it. And I do it only once a year because I don't want to look at my portfolio. <laughs> And even that's really difficult, you know, I look at it and I make a PDF and I give it to my assistants immediately to, to upload it um, in order to not look at it. Uh, the, I have now about 70 stocks and of course half of them have a loss. But only if, I'm, if the losses are a little bit less than the profits, I'm fine. I make a return. And I really like, I really like the fact that I know exactly where I'm invested. And that brings me to the last remark, over those five years where I started to invest and I attended a lot of conferences like that where I listened to other people that are really smart about investing and I also read books, I never came across an argument what should be dangerous about it. You know, it, was, it, was, it was never really convincing that picking a stock should be anything more dangerous than picking an ETF with the only exception that an ETF from day one has more stocks in it than your own portfolio, on the first day your stock portfolio has just one stock, of course. But if you have the discipline and accumulate over time 30 to 50 stocks, you're probably more diversified than, than most of the indices that you find out there, with the big advantage that you really know what's in your portfolio. And when I summarize that into what you really need to know is that you have to move slow. You have to move in slowly because you're going to lose. You're actually going to lose money. When somebody comes to me and says, like, I want to start this, I tell them, buy the first stock and wait for half a year. Typically, they're really nervous after a month because they want to buy the second stock. They got so excited with the first one. I tell them, you have to wait. And if for half a year, you've incurred a loss, you've learned something. You've learned that you can cope with a loss. <laughs> yeah, it's really important. If you actually have made money, you have not learned anything and you have to wait until you finally make a loss someplace. Because the important thing is that you don't move out of your stocks when there are losses. It's really important. So the first rule is really this. <coughs> slowly in, slowly out. That's what safe investing is all about. This rhyme got to me on my uh, sabbatical in New Zealand. I've copied it ever since. And the second one, when you when actually have learned that you should move slowly and not fast, the second one is don't put all eggs in one, in your, in one basket. It's in German a little bit better, nicht alles auf, nicht alles auf eine Karte setzen. it makes it really clear, don't put everything in, on one stock, diversify. Now if you start, you cannot be diversified. But then you have to keep in mind that you're going to save for 30 to 50 years, and you have to look at the amount that you will serve, save over 50 years, and then the loss that you make in the first year is not as bad. I think if you take those two rules, you cannot really do anything wrong. Um, there's also a technical term for it called dollar cost averaging. It's supposed to give you a better return, but actually it doesn't, that doesn't correspond with um, finance theory. Finance theory would say if you're an eternal being, you would invest everything in the market and you would not worry about the losses because you have an eternal lifespan. It doesn't matter. But we are all human beings and you know, the losses really matter. And that's why I say, you know, if you have something get an inheritance, 500,000, start with 10,000 or maybe only 5,000. And I call this the learning money that you have to pay. And then you, you spend those 500,000 over maybe three years. That doesn't matter that you don't have a return on those 500,000. It's a lot more important than when the market crashed that you still have money to invest. And you feel good about all the money you have invested. And at the same time, when the markets go up, you already have participated a little bit. Every banker will tell you that this is a good approach, but nobody will tell you to take three to five years because it's their business model to get the money as quickly as possible. So I can say it because I don't take any money from anyone. Uh, I just provide research. 
when you don't put everything on one basket, you basically have less losses. You know, I have a couple of situations where I lost everything. Debenhams in the UK, it's a retail chain, I had a fraud case, it's zero. I also invested in my Burger high technology company, I lost about 80% of the stock. But if you have 70 stocks, you know, losing everything is only one seventieth. It's not that much money. So if you have if you have this second rule, then actually stock investing becomes a lot less work. You've done it now in five minutes, and every of your decision was not a bad decision because thousands of investors do the same decision right now. How can you be wrong if professionals do the same thing right now? This is my encouragement. I would like to. I would like you to consider looking after your money yourself. Yes. So when decided you decided to sell your stocks? Like... Yeah, I get this all the time. Um, <laughs> I invest my money because I want the return on it, and I sell my stocks when I want the money to buy something else. I mean, I I have a, I have this you know stock uh, subscription where you get stock tips every month customized to you, and. Uh, a year or so ago, someone cancelled it. And I'm actually quite in contact with, my, with the people there, not that many to pay for it. And uh, you know, one said, like, yeah, I have to cancel my subscription um, because you know the markets are going to crash. It's now a year ago. And we still have booming markets. You can never know when the markets crash. For me, when I started in 2015, I thought the markets are at their peak. And I still think to say, <laughs> you know, it's just you cannot, you cannot know better. It's impossible because the market would have crashed if it's not. So for me, it's really I, I have sold now stocks. I'm going to publish that soon when um, there was a spin out and the stock was only two thousand francs in my portfolio. And I said like for two thousand francs, worry about that stock. And I decided either I'm going to buy more, so I have five or ten thousand of that stock, or I sell it all together. So that was the reason why I sold. But I never assume I know something better. So I never assume that uh, this stock is going to crash. Of course, sometimes this stock may, I may come across a quote from the CEO that I find really disgusting, you know, could happen, and then I sell it because I don't want to have it anymore. But I don't assume that this will actually be the moment to sell because I just don't know. If I would spend a lot of time, you know, trying to beat the market and some investors do that, of course, then I would have that problem. But I don't like to spend time investing. It's, it's not my passion. Other questions? Yes. Everyone comes out with his own ESG ratings. When can we expect a standard in the market, like a standard of Poor's or Moody's? I don't think there's going to be a standard, honestly. Uh, I, I tried to show how complicated it is. I really, I think it's really more what you identify with. Um, there was a quote actually on that slide from Antoinette Tunziker. She was also tasking, and she's now a sustainable fund manager for about 10 years. Before that, she was, I do this bad, I think, head of trading. Yeah. Really smart woman. And uh, I actually have this, all these three searches on her <laughs> because I, in panic, I sent her emails like, you know, Antoinette, I have to speak. She you know, often was looking much better at that. Let me, you know, give, give me research. And she gave me, you know, that research, and I look at that, look at that. And, and she actually made the point already a couple of years ago where she said, like, look, Herman, everybody's so different. You know, someone, I, for instance, I like defense stocks. I think it's important that we defend our country. I don't have any problem with that defense weapon stock that we have in Switzerland, who grew up. You know, I don't have a problem. They could go public, I would invest. Because I believe mean, even if some people get killed, you know, innocently, it's really, really important that we are strong as a country and defend our rights. So others, they think this is completely crazy and they would never invest in defense stocks. I think the solution is really more in a dialogue with the person so that their, their ethics or their morals are reflected in their portfolio. And how you can actually instrumentalize that in a product, I don't know. I 
think that's really difficult, but it could happen by being a lot more specific about what the fund is all about. So the fund is not about returns. What I would do if I were a fund manager, I would say we don't publish returns because they're misleading. I'll show you why. Maybe I would put a video online where people can watch why we don't show past returns. And I would say that it's not about the returns because we don't know what the returns will be in the future. It's about your uh, criteria being reflected in the philosophy of the fund manager and the fund. And I would spend a lot more time on that. With Credit Suisse, I just had the addition that I can save a lot of money by putting money into a, uh, into a pension plan, uh, an INCA plan. And, you know, the big problem is, is really that I have no idea who stands behind those plans. You know, they make the investment decisions, I have no idea. They probably switch at one point. <coughs> if I had more identification with the person managing my money, I would feel a lot more comfortable about it. Other questions? We had a speculator over lunch, I think it was either Valentin or it was um, yeah. your idea, basically, where you said, like, I would like to see bankers publish their opinions and you know, what they do themselves. It would really create a lot of trust. And that's something that uh, if I were a bank, which I probably will never be, um, is something I would do. I, would, I think that for a private bank, that creates a lot of trust. When you know what they are doing. Any other question? Should we stop? Hmm?